88.9 WERS. This is the third in a series of oral history interviews sponsored by the Emerson College Archives. My guest today is Dr. Charles w. w. Dudley, who was the chairman of the broadcasting department at Emerson College from 1946 until 1960. Good afternoon, Dr. Dudley, and welcome back to Emerson College. Well, thank you very much, Bob. It's really a great pleasure to be here, and I mean that sincerely. Great. Well, I'm really it, glad that you agreed to do this with us. Well, it brings back so many fond memories of a time which I think is probably one of the most rewarding and exciting of my professional career. My well, the introduction of radio into the speech curriculum and the subsequent development of the broadcasting department under your leadership is, in my opinion, one of the most significant aspects in Emerson's 107-year-old history. But before we talk about your Emerson experience, I'd like you to recall for me, if you can, your earliest memories of radio. Oh, gosh. Uh, not too long after Guglielmo Marconi, about <laughs> really? 20 years later. No, it was in the mid-1920s. I was a lad growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, radio had just come into being as a popular medium. And I went through all of the usual phases of excitement, crystal sets and the like, and it just excited me. I found it a very fascinating thing. And I suppose I would date my real interest in radio, at least in performance, as somewhere in the early 1930s. We then had two local stations, and I aspired right off the bat to be an announcer. And I, I think that's probably uh, the genesis of my professional interest in, in broadcasting. And did your family have a, a console radio set in the living room? Did you gather around it much as families in the 50s did around the newfangled television set? A little bit more primitive than that. We had a, a homemade tube set, five tube superheterodyne it was called, with three dials, a very complicated thing to tune. No loudspeaker at that time. Uh -huh. We had uh, several headphones. My mother and I used to sit around that thing religiously and listen to stations all over the country. Uh, so I was brought up really in an atmosphere of interest in, in broadcasting and what it uh, seemed to have to offer. And you say that you wanted to be an announcer. Can you remember any specific uh, shows or any general things about the programming that especially impressed you? Yes, uh, it was network programming. Uh, NBC was founded, let's see, in 1926, uh, CBS in 1927. And immediately, I seemed uh, pulled toward announcing, as demonstrated by some of the legends, Graham McNamee, uh, John S. Young, Milton Cross. I thought these were models that I would want to follow. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I suppose that sparked, as much as anything, my uh, interest in becoming a professional broadcaster. And so it came time to go to college, and you chose as the college that you wanted to attend the only one I could afford, <laughs> University of Florida. Remember, these were the days of the early depression, and it was very difficult. Although there was no tuition charge at the University of Florida, you still had to come up with about $350 a year uh, for a room and board. And uh, we were in pretty dire circumstances at the time, and there was some doubt as to whether I would get to college. But eventually I did. And University of Florida was one of the pioneers in educational broadcasting. Yes, so it was, it was fortunate that uh, indeed you could it was. afford to go there. Yes, it was one of the 28 so-called land-grant colleges who operated non-commercial educational AM stations. It was a 5,000-watt daytime station. And uh, one, uh, I think, that uh, merits... Uh, some sort of recognition in the, the annals of, of all of broadcasting because it was the spawning ground of a number of people who later went into professional broadcasting and made a name for themselves. But yes, that, that is the case. The University of Florida and I suppose uh, some sort of subsidiary attraction was the fact that it had the radio station WRUF. And, and so what was your participation in WRUF? Well, I was too busy the first two years uh, just making a living. I subsisted on what was called, well, I guess you would call it these days a government handout. It wasn't that at all. 
I, we kind of uh, call it a work study grant. Uh, well, yes, there are more elegant terms these days, but it was NYA, mm -hmm. National Youth Administration, for which I received 50 cents an hour, and I did all sorts of things, washed windows, dug trenches, uh, cleaned out the agricultural barn and the like. But by gosh, it kept me in college for two years. And in the meantime, I used to shadow the studios of WRUF and eventually uh, in my the latter part of my sophomore year, as a matter of fact, I got up the nerve to go out there and made so bold as to ask for an audition to be an announcer on WRUF. Do you remember the first words that you said on the uh, over the air? Not really, because um, before I became an announcer, I did participate in a number of radio dramas. Uh -huh. There was a lot of live broadcasting then and a repertory group of which I was a member. So that was my first experience before a microphone was as a member of the uh, dramatis uh, personae. And when did you get your first uh, study show or your first study announcing spot at WRUF? Well, that was in my junior year, and I suppose I would date it as somewhere in September of, of oh gosh, maybe 1936. Mm -hmm. And my first assignment uh, was a program which uh, certainly uh, squared with my interests, classical music. It was called Hour with the Masters. Mm -hmm. Came on at 3 o'clock every afternoon, 3 to 4 in which we played, of course, recordings. But uh, it was an exciting moment for me, and one which I still dearly cherish. And what were some of the other announcing uh, chores or jobs that you <laughs> assumed? Just there? about everything under the sun, because in those days, uh, broadcasting, both non-commercial and commercial, uh, was characterized by programming which was diversified and varied everything. Uh, and certainly this was true at the University of Florida. Uh, uh, it was one of a number of the, as I mentioned, land-grant colleges that had a college of agriculture. So naturally we had a, a Florida farm hour. Uh -huh. uh, we also did live sports, University of Florida baseball, basketball, football, which I later announced, and then classical music and uh, some semi-popular, but uh, we didn't go whole hog at that time. But on the other hand, and it's kind of contradictory, every Saturday night we had what was called the Orange Grove String Band. Five hours of live down south country music. You may have heard the old uh, tune Orange Blossom Special. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that was originated by that band and I had the opportunity at several times to announce that program. So it was a wide variety of... Let's go back of, to the sports casting for just a minute. Yes. Um, I remember reading that in the early days of radio reporting, uh, they used to have someone at the game who would send the details of the game over uh, teletype wire back to the person in the studio who would then use a variety of sound effects to try and make it sound like he was actually at the game reporting uh, as the events unfolded. Did, did you do any type of that? Yes, I did, and every bit of it is true. And Your really, dramatic training probably came uh, in handy yeah, for that. Then. I think in its most extreme form uh, was a broadcast of the World Series, and I did this for two years running. Uh, we would sit in a studio, and they would be with us, uh, or with me, or whomever, um, with whomever uh, was doing the uh, actual announcing, mm -hmm. uh, a telegrapher. There were, uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen the old so-called sounders. It's a click-click mm. type of thing. Well, there would be a oh, yeah, they tapped That's right. The there would be a telegrapher at the other end at, at the game site, and he would uh, tap out Morse code messages. They were very cryptic. Uh, so was a strike on the outside corner, that sort of thing, uh -huh. and. The guy in the studio, also a Western Union telegrapher, would receive this and he would insert little slips of paper in the typewriter and type it out, hand it to me, <laughs> and then it was up to me or the sportscaster to recreate the situation. And I must say, an awful lot of imagination, if not indeed pure fiction, <laughs> went into that sort of exercise. And then later, a little bit more sophisticated method, uh, we used a what uh, I suppose would best be described as a Wall Street ticker type thing. 
uh, that would be with a bell jar over it, and uh, that would be placed in the studio. And uh, the same sort of cryptic messages would be tapped out, and you'd pull out a piece of the tape, you'd read it off, tear it off and discard it, and do the same sort of imaginative, uh, creative reporting. Uh, as I say, I did two World Series. Uh, I don't recall the teams. I'm sure must, one of them must have been the Cubs and the Athletics. Uh, but that, that was a true test of ingenuity. The only difficulty sometimes, the, uh, there would be an interruption in the transmission, sometimes for as long as a half an hour. And uh, that called for quite a bit of ingenuity. Uh, you could we, say it was raining. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> we used to call a rain delay. Uh, but it was an exciting time, really. Yeah. Okay, so you uh, finished up your undergraduate program. You got your degree. Did you go right to NBC and apply for a no, job as a, not, an announcer? Yet. No. Uh, just let me back up because you, you've kind of sparked a, a point here. Please. Uh, in, in my senior year, uh, I took on uh, a lot of what were generally considered the glamour assignments. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was host of the Florida Farm Hour, and I succeeded a person whom I, I think, at least by name, you would recall, Red Barber. Mm -hmm. Red Barber started out at WRUF, and uh, he conducted the Florida Farm Hour, and I was his successor on that. I also succeeded him in broadcast of the University of Florida football games and baseball games. And then uh, another thing that, that fell to me was uh, the uh, tobacco auctions up in Live Oak and Lake City, Florida. And this was a two-week sojourn in which I covered the auctions and I had to absorb myself and uh, literally uh, become uh, completely involved in, in the milieu and, and create the atmosphere. But and the same type of arrangement then as the, uh, as the sports casting? Except you were on the opposite end this time. The opposite you. end, but this was not recreation. This was actual. Uh -huh. These were, we called them remotes, or actuality broadcast. It was by telephone line, uh -huh. but uh, a very exciting time and a, a, a part of this very versatile experience which we all underwent. Yes, and then uh, after I graduated, I, I stayed on uh, for nearly a year uh, as program director at WRUF. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to get my master's degree, and uh, I knew of another non-commercial educational station, a very well-known one, WILL, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And it so happened that they had an opening for a chief announcer, uh, part-time, mm -hmm. uh, who would also be allowed to pursue graduate work. And through the good offices of my station manager, uh, Major Garland Powell, I remember him well. Uh, he made the arrangements and I was given the job with no audition, no competition or anything. Mm -hmm. So sometime in 1939, I think it was in the fall, I arrived in Urbana-Champaign and uh, went right to work at WILL. And at the same time, I uh, worked on my master's degree. It took me a little longer than the year because I was working part-time and uh -huh. going to school part-time. But uh, here again, uh, just a, a wonderful experience. Uh, the format at WIL was very similar to the one at WRUF. As a matter of fact, I ended up being the host of the Illinois Farm Hour. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm not a rube, but I certainly learned a lot about farming. You had to switch from tobacco to corn. Uh, corn and, and the like, yes. But <coughs> excuse me, that, that was an exciting time too, and I, I gained a lot of very valuable experience. And then. When I did get my master's degree, I, I went back to Florida and uh, I became an announcer at a local commercial station this time because I was still in the process of trying to decide what I wanted to do. And then there was the specter of uh, induction into the armed forces because World War II was coming mm -hmm. on. So I, I took a position at WJHP in uh, Jacksonville and as a staff announcer, but here again, I was fortunate to have a variety of types of experiences. Um, news, I was a newscaster. Uh, I also did sports, live sports, uh, for University of Florida again, when it came to Jacksonville. And uh, then from there, 
I went to Miami, W-I-O-D in Miami, one of the earliest of the broadcasting stations um, and still a very fine station. And this was considered something of a, of a plum to uh -huh. be a staff announcer at W-I-O-D. How well I remember it. Uh, its uh, logo, its v verbal logo, was Wonderful Isle of Dreams, mm -hmm. uh, W-I-O-D, Wonderful Isle of Dreams. And here again, the experience was rather versatile. I was a newscaster, special events man, staff announcer, and the like. Yeah, it sounds like you were building up quite a, a catalog of experience and, you know, a yes. list of uh, increasingly important uh, jobs in larger and larger markets. Certainly, WIOD was right. the largest market yes. you have worked in, and commercial instead of right. uh, educational. Yes. yes. And not unlike many a fledgling announcer, uh, we all aspired to be network announcers mm -hmm. because that was absolutely the cream of the crop. I, I suppose that if announcing ever became a profession, it was during those days. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it is now. I think it's a vocation now because it doesn't meet all of the requirements that one generally ascribes to a profession. But then it was. These were educated men, uh, very versatile, um, spoke with authority and with impeccable English, I must say. So we all aspired to be network announcers. And as I say, I was not unlike the rest of the pack. So I did apply for an audition at NBC and at CBS. I auditioned for CBS at uh, WBBM in Chicago and uh, I auditioned for NBC in New York. And uh, an audition then was a test of one's mettle. Mm -hmm. It was an arduous exercise, 15 minutes of a variety of things, straight narrative reading, uh, commercials, uh, classical terminology, and then a list of pronunciations, and I remember them well. They had to know how to say Kusevitsky. Uh, Kusevitsky, all the classical terminology, and then even ordinary English words, I call them ordinary, such I, I knew that it was sacrilegious and not sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. I knew it was acumen and not acumen, a climate and not acclimate. Uh, I did very well on that. And then the piece de resistance was the ad lib exercise. I was in a small studio, probably 12 by 12. There was a table, a chair, and a microphone. And I, I was instructed to describe for at least five minutes my surroundings, and uh, so it, it was, was an a arduous long five thing. Five minutes yes. to fill. Huh? Well, uh, one would hope that all that ended happily. Well, um, about six weeks later, I got a telegram from NBC uh, offering me a job as a staff announcer. I was absolutely elated, but unfortunately, the day before. I'd also received a telegram from the United States Navy confirming mm -hmm. that I had been given uh, a commission as an ensign. Uh, I, I think you know which one I was obliged to take. Mm. So that began four years of, of service in the, the Navy, and I left the Navy as a lieutenant commander. And during that time, uh, I became a Russian language specialist, uh, quite by chance but uh, I, I still have a fair command of the Russian language. So was your, uh, your radio experience put to use by the Navy? No, of course no. not, of course not. Uh, the armed forces doesn't work that way. Uh, it does the opposite of, of what you're trained for, really. Oh, in a way, I suppose, yes, I ended up in communications, but uh -huh. not, not in performance. But uh, that's a part of another story. All right, yeah. so you, you get out of the Army, and you Navy. find yourself, oh, excuse me, the yeah, Navy. That's all right, yeah. And you find yourself, did you go back to NBC and say, listen, you, no, you offered no. me that job four years ago? Uh, no, no, I didn't, because my whole focus had changed. Um, I somehow became interested in educational broadcasting. I suppose it was my experience at WRUF and at WILL. So uh, I decided that that was the path I wanted to follow. Uh, because by that time, uh, commercial broadcasting was becoming a bit jaded, repetitious, and uh, to me, not all that challenging. So I got in touch with the people at WILL, and uh, 
I went back there immediately after the war in 1946 as program director, and uh, that was a miserable summer. Uh, I had been married uh, three years before, and we had our first child on the way. They had promised us housing, which they were not able to deliver on. So we spent a miserable summer, and uh, I think we were just hoping that something would happen that would get us out of Illinois in middle summer. Uh -huh. My wife was from Worcester. I'm well, from uh, Illinois, and I know what you're talking uh, yeah, about yes. when you talk about the Illinois summers. Uh, yeah, I, I yes, had indeed. to escape myself. Yes. Uh, well, a queer thing. I, I suppose our lives are guided by happenstance, largely, uh, the unexpected turn of events. Uh, while I was at WILL that summer, I was appointed as a delegate to an educational broadcasting conference at the University of Wisconsin on beautiful Lake Mendota. Mm -hmm. And it, we had a marvelous time. And at the end of one session, an afternoon session, I remember it well, it was about five o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the moderator, uh, Harold McCarthy, uh, read a telegram. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, he read a telegram from one Dr. Boylston Green, president of Emerson College, announcing that they had an opening for a founding chairman of a newly established broadcasting department and a position as a full professor, salary not announced at the time. Anyone interested, uh, call Dr. Green, and the telephone number was given. Uh -huh. Well, the, the end of this was that I rushed up to the, the platform and got the information, and at about 5.30 I called uh, uh, Dr. Green, at the number given, and explained who I was and what I was responding to, and uh, gave a brief account of my credentials, my background, and so forth. And uh, he seemed very interested. And he said, call me back at 8 o'clock. He says, I want the opportunity to get in touch with the Board of Trustees and a couple of other people. So I called back at 8 o'clock. He says, when can you be here? So that's how I found out about Emerson. Uh, it was a chancy thing. Uh, I think it took a good deal of good faith on the part of both of us, on the part of Dr. Green and on, on me. But You had never heard of Emerson College at this no. time, right? But you saw, you saw a chance to escape those uh, Illinois yes, summers and you right, jumped at it. Right, and, and this uh, was in the direction in which I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Yes, I remember in that intervening three hours between the time I called Dr. Green and, uh, at first and the later call, I wired a good friend of mine in Boston. Uh, he had lived in the Boston area all of his life. and I, I sent a very simple telegram. What do you know about Emerson College? Well, in due course, in about an hour, I got a reply. Not very much. He says, call me later, which I did. Yeah. But anyway, that's how I I came. Can you imagine that sort of process being followed now? No. Like search committees, uh, democratic process, and all. I can that. understand him saying, "I need time," but I can't imagine that the time yeah. was only three hours, and he called well, you me know, back and said, "Well." Uh, somehow, I, I think that impulse and intuition uh, are not bad things. Well, it worked out well for uh, us yes, at that it point. Did, yeah. uh, so tell me, you came to Boston. I came to Boston. And you arrived at Emerson College, which yes, you knew I, as a name only. And what uh, did you find, and what did you think of it? <laughs> Tremendous disappointment. I suppose that's the reaction that most anyone has when they, they first walk up Beacon Street expecting some grand campus. I came out from the Parker House, and I passed the State House. I said, surely this must be it. This befits uh, an institution of higher learning. And then I walked on out, and I finally came to 1.30. Beacon Street and walked in and I was greeted by one of the most gracious gentlemen I think I've ever known, Elmer Fisher. He was a kind of a major domo. Um, he was a man in his late 60s, um, had no professional credentials. He was just a high school graduate. He used to be what was called a floor walker at Filene's, but he was my first encounter with Emerson. and. He made me very welcome, and then subsequently in the day, of course, I met Dr. Green, with whom I was tremendously impressed. And did you get an introduction to the radio announcing program as it existed at that time? Did he fill you in on what the college had been doing? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. He explained it as a 
a kind of a sporadic offering. Uh, these were separate courses. There was no cohesive curriculum in broadcasting as such. And that's what he uh, intended that Emerson should undertake, an organization, a correlation, a, a cohesion of elements mm -hmm. uh, to bring it up to full curriculum status. Now, until 1952, though, the uh, radio or broadcasting department was a subdivision of the speech department, uh, which was the department which offered the course called Philosophy of Expression, which was the philosophical core of the Emerson College curriculum. Was there any attempt on your part to merge your philosophy of broadcasting with no. the Emerson philosophy of no, expression? No, no, and I think that's one of the early conflicts that we had. Incidentally, the, the term POE, uh, let me back up here a little bit, Emerson. When I first heard the word Emerson, I thought surely this must have to do with Ralph Waldo. Of course, I was wrong. And then soon after I arrived here, I heard everybody talking about POE, Principles of Oral Expression. I took it at first to mean Edgar Allan Poe, but <laughs> I was wrong again. Uh, no, uh, this was a major conflict, and mm -hmm. one which I could not in good conscience reconcile, because it represented the collision of two philosophies. Uh, platform expression is one thing, it's projection. Radio, of course, is another, and, and even television. It's an intimate, one, almost one-to-one. -one. You're not talking to a vast assemblage, but rather to individuals, one or two individuals. And so this had a profound uh, mark, I think, on uh, differing philosophies. So yes, uh, I, I never, oh gosh, forgive me, uh, really subscribed uh, as a radio uh, medium uh, to this type of oratory because mm -hmm. it was inappropriate to. But there were understanding people at Emerson. Uh, one who negotiated this for me, I think, very well was one of the grand old men of, of Emerson, uh, William Kenny. Uh, he sort of took me under his wing. And he was assigned to sit in on your first few classes, <laughs> yes. too, wasn't he? Yes, they didn't quite trust me. And he was quite an intimidating gentleman from everyone else. Uh, he was he very large and he had a booming voice. He was voice. an imposing physical figure. He had a basso profundo voice that shook the heavens. But he was a kindly gentleman. He was in his 70s then. But uh, yes, that's true. Uh, I was young. I was 30. I was not steeped in the Emerson tradition. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I guess I was looked upon with some suspicion. So indeed, in the first semester, he used to sit in on my classes. And then finally, before the semester was out, he came to me and put his arms around me and said, Charles, he said, this is foolish. He says, I'm not going to ride herd on you. He says, you know what you're doing? He says, your philosophy of broadcasting speech is sound. And he's, So yes, he, he was quite an influence, a mediating influence. So here you are, 1946, you're getting ready to implement your broadcasting program at Emerson College. Yes. Now, you, it's a big job. You couldn't do it by yourself, so uh, you had to hire some faculty members. Yes. Did you do the hiring, or were they hired for you? No, no, I, I did all of the hiring. And at first, these were part-time people, and I drew largely upon professionals who had some standing in the, mm -hmm. in the local Boston market. You know, I have a list of names that I've pulled out of the catalogs, and I right. wonder if I could just run them by you, and you could try to give me, you know, a one-sentence uh, impression of what their responsibilities were, what their special skills yeah, yeah. were. I hope I remember some of them. It's been a long time, you know. All right. Uh, the first one is named Eleanor Burt. Uh, yeah, Eleanor Burt. Uh, she was hired at first part-time. She was a young lady who had done copywriting, uh, at one of the local stations. She was very good at it, and we did have a course in writing for radio. Mm -hmm. This later uh, was subdivided into writing for commercial purposes and, and for general purposes. She was well qualified in that respect. And then also she taught a course in broadcasting for women, because mm -hmm. we did have, at that time, a number of women who were interested in broadcasting. But right, and Emerson's uh, student body was composed primarily of women, uh, maybe not by the time you would come, but certainly for the first 50 years before. Oh, yes, indeed, but the balance uh, was shifted, uh, not because I came, it was just coincidental. This mm -hmm. was the return of the GIs, and mm -hmm. I 
certainly in broadcasting, the ratio must have been five to one in favor of men. Mm. Okay, I have another name. Uh, uh, Betty Scalise Killam. Yeah, yeah, Betty Scalise. Uh, she was a person, uh, I remember her well, became a very good friend of mine, uh, who had substantial professional experience in performance in broadcasting. Now, realize at the time that there were no full-time careers in broadcasting for women. Mm -hmm. uh, it was occasional women's programs, occasionally commercials and the like, but she at least had the maximum of this type of exposure and uh, a very able person. And uh, she was the first full-time faculty, additional faculty that I hired. It so happened that uh, for one of the evening courses, I also hired uh, one Eugene Killam, uh, who was um, a copywriter an advertising representative at WBZ at the time. Somehow they met, uh, uh, going from class to class, eventually were married. So Elizabeth Scalise Killam. How about uh, Earl McKinnon? Earl, Earl McKinnon, yes. Um, he had enrolled in Emerson in the master's degree program. By that time, we did have a master's degree in, mm -hmm. in broadcasting. He was a Canadian, a very cultured gentleman, uh, uh, just a wonderful person, had a beautiful voice. And um, he was engaged uh, at first part-time in broadcast announcing, and then later, yes, he did become full-time. How about Bob Ross? Bob Ross was an engineer. He was our first full-time engineer, a very capable technical man, and uh, much credit goes to Bob for uh, establishing a, a sound engineering department, um, and also uh, in the fledgling days of WERS. Uh, I believe, the next name, William Pierce, I believe he's still active in radio in the, yes, in the Boston is. area. Yes, he is. He's uh, uh, started out as a staff announcer at WGBH-FM, uh, and for many, many years, uh, has been the announcer for the Boston Symphony and the Boston Pops. And Bill uh, was hired as a part-time person only, and throughout the time that he was associated with Emerson, he was part-time, and he taught courses in beginning and advanced broadcast announcing. Conrad Jameson. Conrad Jameson, a rare character, if there ever was one. Well, Connie, his full-time job was an instructor in Latin at Boston Latin School. Uh, but he had a, an avocation which was almost his vocation. As a radio actor, he appeared in some of the early dramatic presentations over WEEI. These were all live in the early days of broadcasting. And he was quite a character actor, and he appeared on stage and uh, just an ebullient, outgoing personality. And uh, he, again, was part-time and taught courses in radio production and radio drama. Uh, Jack Raines. Jack Raines uh, was a young man um, who was hired full-time. Uh, this had to be now up into the middle and latter 1950s. Mm. Uh, full-time as principally an instructor in radio announcing and um, production. And I think I, I'll stop with the names there because I'm getting a little ahead of myself yeah, if I'm sure. up to the mid-50s. Yeah. Uh, but I'm trying to get at the group of people that you pulled around, pulled together to implement your broadcasting program. Yes. And okay, we have our faculty, now we need some sort of a classroom facility. Now, I understand that when you arrived at Emerson in 1946 that the uh, broadcasting studio, I would put a picture up of it here, that was in the basement of 130 Beacon Street was in the process of undergoing a renovation. And just let me point out that uh, Arthur Reeds is standing there, as yes. is uh, William Kenny, both yes, of who we yes, spoke about a little bit before. Yeah. Um, you I never taught classes in I this never room, taught classes. I saw it. That was one of the first things that I was shown when I arrived here mm -hmm. that fateful day in August of 1946. But then I was taken up to the second floor and shown 
what was in being, that is a fully equipped, uh, professionally engineered uh, studio setup. But this was very primitive. It was a little more than a public address system, really. Let me I, put up a, a picture of what I think then is the studio that was under construction and see if you can verify that for me and describe a little bit of what's going on there. Yes, indeed, I can. Uh, that, uh, the, in the foreground is the uh, audience area. Behind the glass, of course, is the studio itself, and beyond that is the control room. And um, this was all professional equipment. These were Western Electric uh, consoles. They were in uh, current use at all the major radio stations. So then is this the same facility? Oh, yes, it is. I recognize both of them. In the control room is Brad Tiffany, an energetic young man mostly interested in engineering. And in the foreground is Bill German, one of my very dedicated uh, broadcasting students who later went out to Michigan. I think he's now manager of a state, uh, manager owner of a station in Michigan. Yes. And would, would Brad Tiffany later uh, be a part of your, your faculty in the division? Uh, uh, not really in an official way. Mm -hmm. uh, he always hung around, as they say, uh, always interested mostly in the technical aspects of it. Yeah, I have one more here. I assume the same. Yes. Studio. Uh, Todd Stecklman uh, at the microphone. I can't quite make out the person at the console. But that, yes, that, that's in the studio. All right, but now, at this point, we're still talking about <coughs> a, basically a studio classroom. Uh, I believe that Emerson's uh, WECB station was right. established by 1943, but that was just w wired to uh, broadcast to the lobby of 130 Beacon Street and maybe to the dormitory up at the other end of Com Ave, right? Yes, it was an extended public address system. So that's what we have here is it's just the turntables and the microphone hooked into that PA system, right? Well, that could well be. I, I think, though, you're looking at uh, WERS there. But essentially the same sort of setup, All right, studio well, setup. Before we talk about WERS, yes. uh, did you, you came from WRUF uh, and WILL, and yes. I imagine that you used those as a model of uh, the kind of station that you wanted to set up as an educational facility and also as an educational broadcasting right. service. Yes. Uh, you came here and WECB was in place. Did yes. you attempt to use that in, in the first few years of your teaching? No. Uh, we're talking about a, a relatively short time span here. Mm -hmm. I came in 1946. WECB was already in existence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think WERS my memory is a little hazy on this. It was either 1948, 1949. Maybe you have the latest. November that. 49 was For, the day right, you went 49. on the air. All right, 49. So it was a relatively short time span. Mm -hmm. Took me about a year to get my feet wet here. So I, I didn't impose a philosophy on WECB uh -huh. because the students at that time were primarily, let's face it, interested in becoming disc jockeys, and it, it performed that function. So I, I didn't in, attempt at that time to impose any philosophy upon WECB. Yeah. It it's interesting that today they, they use WECB to be a model of a more commercial radio station. They sell time to advertisers, which is something that WERS doesn't do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's get to the discussion of WERS. Yes, WERS. Uh, I guess it was somewhere in 1947 I had heard of an action by, or a, a pending action by the FCC to set up a separate ban for low power non-commercial stations. It was 88.1 and the power was limited to a maximum of 10 watts. Uh, Syracuse University was interested in developing this concept in concert with General Electric, which was located in Schenectady. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones who developed the first low power transmitter. I was called upon along with representatives from uh, Schene uh, uh, University of uh, Schenectady um, and uh, representatives of the radio office of the Office of Education to give testimony to the FCC 
Uh, so we all gathered in Washington, gave testimony, and the end result was that the FCC did establish this special frequency, 88.1 low power. Mm -hmm. Almost immediately, I had dreams. And what year was that in? Uh, that was about the latter part of 1947 into 48. Mm -hmm. So I immediately uh, had visions of Emerson's uh, opting for one of these uh, assignments. So that set in motion the application process. I talked with uh, the then president. Uh, let's see, I think Dr. Green had left or was about to leave at that time, and the interim president was Dr. Godfrey Dewey. Mm -hmm. I presented the idea to him. He thought it was a capital idea, wanted to know what the financial implications were <laughs> and the like, and I reassured him on that. So we made application for WERS. Um, ironically, in submitting our choice of call letters, I submitted as a first choice WECB, Emerson <laughs> College, Boston. Uh -huh. But that had already been assigned to uh, uh, some other type of service. So the second choice was WERS, Emerson Radio System, whatever. So we applied for it. In the meantime, uh, we set about uh, establishing the technical arrangements and also at an early time setting up a program philosophy and later a program format. We made the application, it was ultimately approved, so that was the beginning of WERS. Yeah, I'd like to spend a good deal of time talking about that because I, I think that the fact that Emerson was able to acquire a license and start WERS is certainly one of the most far-reaching uh, events in the college's history. I mean, you said you had never heard of Emerson College, but so many times today, you say Emerson College, and they're not too sure. You say WERS. Yes. Ah, uh, I know WERS, yes. Brockhurst it's, Service it's, of Emerson College. It certainly gave it identification. Yes. yes. Well, let's talk about the financial implications. Were there, was there any big startup cost? Um, I mean, was it just the the idea of adding a transmitter to the existing studio and Essentially you were that, there? Yes, the, the two most costly items were the transmitter itself mm -hmm. and the antenna system. Uh, I think in total, this probably came to about thirty-five hundred dollars. The college did put up roughly half of that, and we raised the other from some uh, benefactors, donors. So the the initial cost was about $3,500. I well remember putting up the antenna. We were behind schedule. It was late in November, mm -hmm. and we had to have a rigging crew that came from somewhere in Rhode Island. They didn't get here until late in the afternoon. There was a storm coming up, or icing conditions, but they erected, a, I think it was about a 40-foot tower on the top of 130 Beacon Street. I must uh, mention in, in this, lest it gets lost, uh, the name of, of an unsung hero at Emerson, John Quincy Adams, Sr. He was a retired engineer from WNAC, mm -hmm. and uh, he donated a lot of his time and effort and blood, sweat, and tears in, in helping us, not only with this, but later in developing television. Well, before we get to the... Uh programming part of yeah. uh, ERS, just to kind of make it easy, let's talk about the, let's trace the development of the transmitters yeah. and right. the uh, boost uh, in power. Yeah, uh, the first transmitters I say was a low power 10 watt GE. We had that for one year. It could get out only about six miles and we were impatient and wanted better coverage. So we uh, bought a 250 watt GE transmitter and with the type of antenna that we had it had an effective radiated power of 330 watts mm -hmm. so we could proudly announce that we have 330 watts. We sold the little 10 watt transmitter to the school district in New City, Indiana. I remember they came here one summer with a trailer on the back of a car and we loaded that on and off they went. Uh, and then we had the GE 250 watt transmitter with an effective radiated power of 330 watts. But we weren't satisfied. We wanted more power. 
We sold that transmitter to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And then we bought a 5,000 watt RCA transmitter. It was considered distress merchandise mm. because FM wasn't going anywhere. This was a massive three section unit. I think I have a picture. You probably do. Oh, we were so proud of it. The thing at ordinary, that, no, that no. yeah that yeah yeah here you get part you get only well you can see oh, a yeah, part I have of a better picture yeah yeah there we are it was a massive thing uh, it ordinarily would have gone for I think about sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars we bought it for five thousand dollars again we raised money for this because they thought FM was going nowhere that's right that's right and lucky it, assumption for us how yeah, we never could yeah. have afforded it it was considered 5, distressed merchandise they were glad to get rid of it. So now help me locate this within 130 Beacon Street. Where that was are up we on now? the third floor and on the riverside, on the back side. And uh, oh, what a, uh, oh yes, and then we improved the antenna system. Mm -hmm. And we had what was called an effective radiated power of 18,000 watts. Well, we were gratified with the coverage, but uh, the neighbors were dismayed <laughs> because <laughs> this went into everything. So one lady called up and said, I'm getting WRS on my toaster. <laughs> uh, so we had, to, we had the obligation under FCC regulations to install what were called wave traps to trap out WRS. But I tell you, that was a proud moment when we fired that thing up. And how far out could the uh, signal uh, be heard then? It uh, depended upon the direction and conditions. It could get out uh, as much as 30 miles, 30 miles out, 30, sometimes 40 miles. We did get reports from southern New Hampshire, but it appreciably increased the, the coverage and sometimes the aggravation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now it's... Uh the question, I, the first question I have about the educational impact of WERS being here at Emerson College was that how did you balance your need now to train broadcasting professionals against the fact that your classroom was going out over the air? You know, you were no longer in one room yeah. in 130. You were in New England. Well, it was a dilemma. The easy way out of it would have been to concede that this was primarily a station a laboratory, if you will, for students. Mm -hmm. But that was not the intent originally. It was not the basis upon which we applied for the license. Uh, the rationale was really in response to the FCC stipulations was that it be an educational, non-commercial, educational broadcasting facility. So that had to be paramount. Mm -hmm. uh, the training of students became secondary. And what's more, that training had to be selective. Not everyone could be on. You, you had to work your way up. Uh -huh. And in that respect, I think it had a sanguine effect because it showed the competitiveness uh, that they would uh, certainly run into in commercial broadcasting. Uh, but in some way or other, everyone was given an opportunity. If not on the air, certainly in writing, in production, and in a variety of other tasks. But make no mistake about it, uh, the uh, dominating philosophy was educational, secondarily as a training facility for students. Okay, so let's talk about what type of programming you yes. initiated. Did you allow students to help develop new types of oh, programs? Oh, yes, yes. This was a part of the process, mm -hmm. yes. It encouraged, as a matter of fact, it became exercise material in, in several classes, production and, and the like, newscasting. And, oh yes, yes, they had a, a very strong role in uh, the creative process. Now this was under general guidelines. We all operated under a philosophy mm -hmm. that this was to be a program uh, operation uh, which emphasized uh, cultural, educational, informational, uh, rather than purely, exclusively entertainment. We didn't eschew that. that. That became a part of it, but probably at a little bit more elevated scale. Well, I have uh, one of the program guides from uh, December and January of 1955 that certainly demonstrates the diversity of programming and the ambitious broadcasting schedule that ERS kept to on yeah. you know, a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, you might want to spread this out in front of you if you need uh, any sort of jog for your memory. And I'm going to put some pictures up here of some of the different scenes from ERS broadcasting. All right. Oh, yes. Very familiar. Not hard to see what's yeah. going on here, huh? Oh, that was our new studio. Uh, very proud of that. Uh, students and I built that. Literally built it. It was up on the third floor on the Beacon Street side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was a part of the operation. We uh, subscribed to INS, which is now defunct, mm -hmm. and uh, at one time APE, uh, and then later United Press. An exciting time. This place buzzed with ingenuity, excitement. I don't know if you can even... I can't tell exactly what's going on in this picture. Maybe you can remember. I mean, is it a radio drama that's happening? Yes, yes. It looks very much like a radio... Yes, I'm sure it was. I, uh, John Gallardi uh, Lynn... somebody from Texas. My memory sparks at times, it fades at other times. This is not as good of a picture, but I think it shows a little more of the variety, the, the sound effects machines right. in the yes. back there. Well, so. I recognize one person in the background, in the control room, Bob McKay, class of 1950, excellent broadcasting student, auditioned uh, upon graduate, well, before graduation, auditioned at WBZ for a vacancy there and got the job. Even before he graduated? Yes, yes, yes. He later, though, went into insurance. I don't know what the circumstances <laughs> were. All right. What, what is going on here? Looks like uh, a political figure. Uh, yes. Um, well, this was undoubtedly one of our public service uh, programs. Uh, Dick, um, oh, I remember him. Can't remember his name. Fine announcer, though. He had had previous broadcasting experience, but wanted to have a college education, came to Emerson, became one of our stalwarts. So this is, but this is definitely not 130 Beacon Street here. No, no, no. Um, so you didn't only do studio programs. Oh, no, you... no. That, that was the beauty of it. Um, we recognized Boston as a vast reservoir of programming opportunities. Uh -huh. And also, Emerson College itself is a reservoir of, of talent. And we tried to exploit that. We did remotes from all over the city on a variety of occasions. Um, we were the first station in Boston to carry on a regular live basis the uh, American Guild of Organists. Mm -hmm. uh, it so happened in a particular year that uh, the director of music here, professor of music, Grover Oberly, mm -hmm. was the uh, president of the Boston chapter. Yeah, there we are, right there. Uh, was president of the Boston chapter of the American Guild of Organisms, uh -huh. and we set up live remotes. Is that from one of the churches? Then yes, in the it was. That, that looks like Old South. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I remember that's a girl. Uh, I can't remember her name. Chris, Chris, somebody, a devoted person, more interested in engineering, incidentally, than anything. But that was uh, somewhat symbolic of the type of thing that we did. We used to broadcast live from the Longy School of Music. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one special occasion, and I did the announcing myself. We did a broadcast from just down the street, I think it was probably 136 Beacon, the home of Miklos Schwab, who's a pianist, I think he's still alive, mm -hmm. of some note in the Boston area. And uh, he had a beautiful, Salon studio up on the third floor of his apartment there overlooking the river. And I remember it was about twilight one night in this beautiful Steinway, and we did an hour long live broadcast of Miklos Schwab. That sort of thing. It was so exciting. basically, if it was happening in the Boston area, right, right, you could get yeah, there and yeah. broadcast it. Huh? Particularly uh, notable was election coverage. Uh, we went all out, and uh, I remember. One of the radio columnists, uh, Bill Buchanan, of one of the Boston papers, one year wrote us up as probably having the best, most accurate, and quickest election coverage of any station, commercial or otherwise. I mean, we had 
usually involved maybe 50, 75 people in that. Again, remote live broadcasts. Can you help me identify who this gentleman is here? He looks like yes. he has a scrapbook out. All right. Um, God, I wish I could dredge you. He's a, a long time, I think he's now deceased, long time drama critic. Not Elliot Norton. It wasn't Philip Hale? No, 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 no. I wish I could dredge his name up, but a courtly gentleman. Mm -hmm. Uh, very incisive. Uh, a local man who worked for a Boston yes, paper? Yes, I, I don't know which one. I wish I could remember his name. I simply don't. But that, again, is, is uh, some evidence of the type of things that we did. Right. I, I believe this is a uh, Longy School yes, broadcast. Yes. Yeah, uh, this was done from our studio. You know, uh, Bob, uh, before we sat down here this afternoon, you took me on a tour of radio studios, and I didn't recognize very much. It's all new equipment, except one thing. What's that? Grand piano, nine foot Steinway Grand. Pretty battered now. But that was the first really good concert piano we had, and it was located in this studio at another end. Yes, indeed. Uh, and this studio, incidentally, was designed by an acoustician from MIT, Tony Lang of Lang Baruch. And he designed it especially. It had an unusual ceiling. And that was designed really primarily for the Longy School because we had developed an affiliation with them. And we had many fine live broadcasts. And I know your preference is for classical music, but I think this picture demonstrates that you did let down your guard a little bit and oh, let yes. some popular, uh, uh, yes, yes, popular music go over the air. Yes, we did. Tom, oh gosh, a failing of being 71 years old, I'm afraid. A, a very dedicated, devoted broadcasting student. Uh, after he graduated, he went to the Cape and helped found the first FM station there. Lamentably, though, uh, Tom met with an accident. He tripped on the stairs mm. and was killed. So I think those pictures really do demonstrate that there was a great diversity of oh, yes, programming. Yes. Yeah, look, uh, don't get the, the notion, please, or anyone who might see this, uh, this little conversation that we're having, that uh, I was anti popular, I, let alone rock and roll. I, some of it I enjoy. Uh, what I'm talking about here is dedication to a philosophy of, of immense variety and versatility, of, of bringing a little of everything that's available in the cultural realm. And I use cultural here advisedly in a larger sense, anything that's a part of our culture. That was, that was really basically the mission of WRS. Well, and there was no shortage of outlets for popular music on the airwaves, and there were certainly, was certainly not. only a few stations in the area that were doing this kind of programming. That's, that's right. Who were uh, the other schools in the Boston area that were offering similar types of broadcast training well, that were, in a sense, our competition? Yeah, the, the, really, the only competition was WBUR, mm -hmm. uh, which came on the air after WERS. This was a source of some debate. Mm -hmm. Even WGBH got in the act, but it was uh, established by FCC records that WERS was the first regular uh, non-commercial FM station in Boston. There was an experimental station called W1XHR out in Cambridge, uh, but it was purely experimental. Yes, WBUR, and they had at the time a similar format, uh, but they abandoned that, went the other extreme, and now they've come back, not to center again, but a little bit more ponderous than I would like to see a station be. So you apply for your license to WERS, you get your broadcasting license, you implement this incredible teaching laboratory and educational radio broadcasting service. That's not enough. You decide you want to start training people for television. Yeah, it was on the horizon. We knew we had to meet it somehow, so 
I've got a, a picture of the first way that you met the challenge <laughs> of television broadcasting. I'd like you to yeah. give me a description of what exactly is going on here. Well, maybe I, I should do that with some embarrassment, but I'm not embarrassed at all. Those are mock-up cameras. I made them myself at my home in Littleton. I remember them. These were mock-up cameras made to look like cameras. They were on a tripod. It spun. It had a handle. It had a some sort of uh, representation of a lens, mm -hmm. three lenses. It could be rotated. But it had a, a live pilot light. And what I was interested in, first of all, was having them react to the camera, to be able to follow it, to speak to it. And when we changed from camera to camera, and we could do that, uh, they would follow the light, not sometimes as Alastair Cook does. You catch him in the act. <laughs> uh, but to gradually, you know, sort of look over. Uh, but it, it was a start. How and many so, years did we use this for? Uh, about a year, a, a little over a year. I, let me see, I recognize a couple of these people. Uh, Toddy Hawes, John Gillardi again, the back of Brad Tiffany. But uh, let me tell you, it was exciting. It was exciting. It was better than, than uh, faking it all the way. And the and startup cost of uh, television uh, closed circuit were a great deal more than the startup oh, yes. cost for uh, broadcasting oh, radio, oh, right? Oh, certainly, yes. But somehow, well, we, found, yes. we found a way to do it. Well, I followed the literature assiduously to look out for new developments. And I came across an ad of Dage Electronics, and they are announcing the introduction of a new line of low-cost Viticon cameras, not image orthicon, but Viticon cameras, a small tube, made largely for industrial uses. And they had a brilliant engineer, Joe Alinsky, who developed this line. Well, I wrote to him. I got an immediate response with a catalog and everything. And I think the total cost of all that Dage equipment, these were small cameras about so long, about that wide, um, I think the total cost was something in the order for the whole package, maybe $10,000. Hmm. Where was Emerson going to get $10,000? Well, we set out on a fundraising campaign, the broadcasting department itself. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we raised, I don't know, something in the order of $20,000. We got the Dage equipment, and uh, we had some problems with it at first. It, it was a kind of an anxious time, but we, and Joe Alinsky came on from Indiana to help us work it out, but finally we got started. Yeah, just and to give an idea of how new this equipment was, you said before it was... Uh, uh, it was the second of the first production run. In other words, they had pr a prototype. They had one production run, and then we were the second production run. It was very new and vulnerable, but we knew that, but we took the chance. But that's, that's how we got started. I have a picture of a broadcasting oh. professional behind the uh, yeah. viewfinder of the day's that's, camera. That's Charles Duddle. That's not a very flattering profile of him, but yes, indeed. And another action shot. I mentioned before John Quincy Adams. There he sits at oh, the great. desk. Uh, that was just a, a kind of a setup. Uh -huh. uh, he wasn't actually performing. But Emerson owes a, a great debt of credit to him. But those, so, were, those were the Dage cameras, yes. This is set up then for closed circuit broadcasting, right? Right, yes. Where on campus were the uh, monitors located? Uh, Located throughout the what were then the three buildings, that was the extent of it. And out out here, we're located in what used to be the the theater, uh -huh. and they were out here. As a matter of fact, we originated a couple of remotes from the stage end of, of this old theater. But no, it was closed circuit. That's all it could be, and it was going to find. Uh, to these three buildings. What was the programming like? Was it as ambitious as what you were doing with WERS? No, no, no. it was very limited. Um, really, at most, was two hours a day. Mm -hmm. It was mostly for classroom instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, the closed circuit aspect of it was, was minimal. I think I have a picture of uh, that remote that you're talking yes about. Yes, 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 that's right. 
That's it, in fact. Now, yeah. what is going on here? I've looked at this picture over and over again. I can't, for the life of me, figure out the man is wearing a, uh, some sort of a oh, safari hat or something. I recognize two people. Stuart Postal mm -hmm. was a full-time professor, mm -hmm. uh, and he was teaching television production. And back of the camera is Ted Phillips, who used to be the chief engineer and who was my successor as uh, chairman of the department. You know, honestly, I can't tell you. I wasn't there. I can't tell you what's going on. But uh, apparently, it required this kind of expanded setting, so we moved the cameras and all the equipment out here. Yeah. Did you ever explore the idea of getting an educational broadcasting television license for Emerson College? Uh, in all candor, I didn't. Uh, the possibilities were so remote. Um, channels were at a premium for one thing, mm -hmm. and the enormous cost uh, w was just a, a formidable barrier. So I, yes, the idea crossed my mind, wouldn't it be nice, but even a UHF channel, which um, at that time, really, they weren't very successful, uh, but even at that time, the, the startup costs, you were, you were talking, oh, in the order of half a million dollars, even at that time, for a startup of a UHF station, so it, it was beyond the pale. No possibility. As we've, as, as I've been putting up these pictures, you've uh, mentioned certain students identified them. Uh, yeah. I'd like to now turn to just the general issue of students that pass through the program mm -hmm. under your direction. And mm -hmm. uh, again, I have some names of some people that I think went through your program. Like to see what you can remember about them. Yeah. But before I say, uh, say any individual names, I just would like to bring out the fact that the 1950 yearbook, which would be the yearbook of the first graduating class to go through your program, mm -hmm. was dedicated to you and certainly demonstrates the uh, affection and admiration that the students here had for you and, and the well, contribution you were making to Emerson College at that, that was, time. That was a very proud moment in my life, uh, really, because uh, I was a newcomer and as I've told you before, I didn't always subscribe to Emerson philosophy and everything, but uh, we managed to make a, an imprint. And yes, it was a, an enormously gratifying moment in my whole life, really. And I don't confine it to my tenure at Emerson, but to be recognized for having done a little bit anyway. I think one of the first, if not the first, uh, student general manager for WERS was uh, a gentleman named Bill Zatzmary. Yes. Better known by uh, another name. Bill Dana or Jose Jimenez. Bill was a brilliant guy uh, intellectually and uh, in many other ways. Uh, just a fine gentleman from Quincy. The Zathmary family. He had a brother, Irving Zathmary, who made quite a name for himself in a less conspicuous way as a uh, composer of movie music. Mm. Uh, they were a bright and energetic family, and Bill certainly was one of the outstanding students. I think another one who is not really well known by his real name, but known by a stage name, is Morton Dubitsky. Yes, Morton Dean. Yes, another uh, very serious minded, uh, at least in my classes, and I understood that he had another side of his character. He was a <laughs> happy go lucky, fun loving guy. But uh, he was. Well, it's a good thing he was serious in your your class. <laughs> yeah, they, I guess I had something of a reputation. Uh, uh, they used to call him. So I heard later, old stone face or something like that. Well, but he needed to know what was being uh, yes, taught in your discipline. class for discipline his uh, what future I'm talking career. About. Yeah, discipline is what I'm talking about, uh, particularly in the usage of the English language. Uh, yes, Mart was a very bright student, uh, completely committed to broadcasting. Uh, served uh, uh, some sort of apprenticeship at a number of uh, or several local radio stations and then went to New York and became one of the top news people at CBS. Uh, he left there several years ago and is now with Cable Network, but a very fine uh, television journalist. Uh, another local radio television personality uh, is Dave Maynard. Dave Maynard. 
I have fond memories of Dave. Uh, how he presented really only one phase to me, and that was the happy-go-lucky type guy. And I, He's still presenting that. Though. Yes, I guess. Uh, I would have tagged him almost to the outset as, as uh, a future disc jockey, uh, which, in fact, he turned out to be. He's, as you know, he's quite a radio personality. Uh, that style of broadcasting is not my cup of tea, but uh, I guess I had something to do with providing some basics. Uh, I remember, oh, this had to be maybe seven or eight years ago, I was attending the home show down at the Heinz Auditorium when it was then open. And uh, Dave Maynard was doing a remote from there. And uh, in between shows, he saw me and he came rushing forward and God, he was just so magnanimous and, and happy to see me and thanked me for having pulled a few reins on him sometimes. And it was a very happy reunion. You mentioned Bob McKay before. Now, what, what did he go on to do after he was... Uh, I think he went into insurance. Uh, Bob had a beautiful voice, but it wasn't quite adaptable to the kind of requirements at, at uh, WBZ. He did an excellent job there, but I, I guess he just decided that he wanted to do something else and went into insurance. Well, which brings up a, a point. You're citing some of the more obvious names, but you know there were many students who haven't hit, as we would say, the spotlight, mm -hmm. but who became successful, not only in broadcasting, but in other fields. I can think of people who started out in broadcasting, decided that they didn't want to pursue that, and went into other fields. And one name sticks in mind, Ray Alexander, I think had the most beautiful radio voice I've ever heard. Deep, mellifluous, uh, wonderful control over it, handsome guy, but uh, decided he wanted to do something else. I, I understand that he's the vice president for personnel at Polaroid or Raytheon, I'm not sure, but. Nonetheless, he, he felt that his training equipped him for something in a, in a unique way. So it isn't only the, the more obvious ones, but the many, many others, uh, men and women, um, who passed under my tutelage that I'm just as proud of as the, the more obvious ones. Yeah, I noticed when I was compiling these names that they are all men, and I wondered, you know, that yeah. reflects maybe a little bit of the sexism in the industry at the time. Well, there's, there's no doubt of it. There's no doubt of it. Uh, uh, prior to World War II, it was a male-dominated profession. Of course, we're talking about radio then, and that carried over into television. Uh, it's only within recent years uh, in television that you have the the entrance of uh, women on an appreciable basis. Mm -hmm. And I think in many respects they're co-equal in, in ability. My gosh, a Diane Sawyer, uh, uh, you name it, uh, uh, Judy Woodruff. Uh, there, there shouldn't be any distinction. Did you try to give women an equal shot then at announcing yes, at yeah. ERS? Oh, yeah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I, I suppose we were the only station in Boston that had women announcers at the time. But they were also counseled on, on the wisdom of unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that yes, you can receive this training and all of that, but don't expect in the, the real life world that it's going to work out this way. Uh, I was going through back issues of the Berkeley Beacon. I think I saw something about uh, an ERS announcer that was awarded the Tom Phillips Award, the UPI Tom Phillips Award. Yes, that really came after my uh, uh. having left. Uh, the Tom Phillips Award, as I understand it, is a prestigious uh, award given by one of the wire services mm -hmm. uh, in recognition, uh, recognition of outstanding journalism. and. Uh, Emerson, I think, on not one, but on several occasions received this award. I yeah. think it was the first time that a student had received yes, uh, the yes. award. So yes, yeah. I think you could take some of the credit because he went well, through the program that you started. Well, at, at least, least it was an extension of a tradition that we tried to in instill. I'd like to now, if we could, branch out a little bit from the broadcasting 
department and talk a little bit about its place in the Emerson College curriculum and your relationship with uh, other academic departments, uh, both good and bad. I imagine there might have been a little bit of friction because it sounds like a lot of the attention, a lot of the students, a lot of the success, and a lot of the glory were going to the broadcasting division. Yeah. Yeah. But let's talk about the positive aspects of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Did you know what did you do with the drama department, or what did you do with the speech department? Yeah. Well, Bob. Uh, I'm not nearly as reluctant as you appear to be on this because I, I have to start from somewhere. Uh, it, it certainly was a neutral atmosphere at the outset, if not in some respects negative. Mm -hmm. uh, not only was I new, but broadcasting, radio, was new. It was an interloper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose it stepped on some toes. And I've already mentioned a collision of philosophies here, of a different type of oral presentation. So at first, uh, there was skepticism, certainly, about the um, validity of training in, in this new medium, um, and even resistance. But as time went on, and I, I made a conscious effort, really, uh, to bring this about. Um, I don't take great credit for it. Maybe I was just the catalyst that brought it about. To at least have, an have them have an understanding of what we were about and then gradually to draw them in. And on WERS, for instance, uh, we had very close cooperation uh, on an informal basis, not on a class basis, curriculum basis, but uh, informal basis with people in the drama department, all with the consent and endorsement of uh, Mrs. Gertrude Binley Kay, who was the, the then chairperson of the they were still called chairman then, uh, of the drama department. Uh, a very fine and wonderful and uh, kind of a dominating uh, personality. And she and I at first didn't strike it off too well, but gradually we became very good friends. But the point I want to make is that we did make a conscious effort to involve other elements of the, the college. And certainly in our dramatic presentations, of which there were many, we drew upon uh, the membership of, of that student body. I, re I remember, uh, I throw out a name here, Dick Dysart, mm -hmm. Richard Dysart, whom you know has achieved significant uh, prominence in Hollywood and in television itself. Dick uh, did many fine performances in our dramatic presentations. And so it was not only radio station WRS, but when you got the TV studio up and running too. Right. And did they use it to try and train people for television acting then? Yes, yes. And that, that came along a little di with difficulty too because, uh, again, it was a collision of philosophies here. The drama was a projectional technique. Right. And, uh, of course, television was more intimate. And that adjustment had to be made. And this sometimes collided with philosophy. But we somehow mediated that. and. Uh, but yes, it was a conscious effort, and uh, uh, I think that it was enhanced as time went on. Now with the speech department, uh, oh, roughly the same, I suppose, but uh, there was, um, well, I don't want to go into that. Uh, there wasn't that kind of close understanding. Uh, we tried, we tried. But on the other hand, uh, many of the people in the speech department went through broadcasting, and uh, I, I don't attach any significance to this, but I do remember them as faces. I remember John Zacharis and uh, Phil Amato and Ken Cornell. Ken Cornell, really, um, uh, to digress, uh, is, is one of the pearls of Emerson. He's a, a longitudinal extension mm -hmm. student up through the junior faculty ranks and now into the senior faculty ranks. I Plus think. in the area of his specialty, I mean, he is a connection way back to what they taught people to do in the first That's time right. that Emerson College ever convened a class. So That's you know, right. beyond That's right. his experience as a student, yeah. he really draws the line back yeah. to the original Emerson curriculum. That's right, and I'm, I'm very fond of him, and I see him about once a year at the annual corporators meeting, and it's always a happy meeting. Now, during the 14 years that you were here, 
Emerson went through about four presidents. Yeah. Uh, in the same way that uh, I gave you names of uh, your division faculty members, mm -hmm. I'd like to present the names of the presidents that you saw come and go and ask you to just give me your capsule impression of them. What, right. you know, did they help you? Did they hinder you? Or would you, you know? Yes. So the first one would be Boylston Green, the man yes. who hired you. Highly supportive. This was his dream. Uh, I think he was dissatisfied with this disjointedness mm -hmm. of the, you couldn't even call it a curriculum, but the, the miscellany, the uh, concatenation, to, to use an elegant word, uh, a series of, un, uh, in, well, disconcatenation in this respect, but the lack of continuity in relationship. And he envisioned the setting up of a department which had an organized curriculum, uh -huh. very supportive. But I think Emerson owes him great credit, and not many people will recognize this, great credit for having elevated it to true collegiate status. Mm -hmm. It was still known, even in 1946, as a school of oratory. Mm -hmm. Well, he was apparently charged by the Board of Trustees to change that seeking accreditation of introducing more liberal arts, of a cohesive liberal arts uh, program to complement, uh, not supplement, because supplement means a, a kind of a demeaning or at least an inferior position, but to complement the specialty. Not to change it, but to give it body and strength. And he achieved that. And under his tutelage, in his tenure, Emerson College, for the first time, was accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, which is the regional accrediting agency. And it must have been a difficult situation for him to step into because um, not only was he the first president that had not been through the Emerson system. That's right. Because Emerson, of course, yeah. Rolf, yeah. Southwick, and Ross, Harry Seymour Ross, lived on Dr. Emerson's farm when he was a student, so That's there right. was a direct line. Yes. Uh, but he was only the fourth, the fifth president in 67 years. That's right. So, yeah. you know, he was really yeah. taking on a big challenge. And I think it's very significant that he was from the outside. Yes. Because I think he realized what you were trying to do, and he himself didn't have any resistance no. to that. No, no, uh, very supportive. And he was a scholar, a scholar in his own right, a legitimate Ph.D. in English and a uh, professor of English at uh, Wofford College in South Carolina, and later president of Sewanee University, University of the South. And he was succeeded by Godfrey Dewey, who you mentioned Dewey. before. Well, Godfrey Dewey was a member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, his main interest was uh, in Lake Placid, New York, the Lake Placid Club. I remember him well. Uh, and his wife, a charming, charming lady. But he took the job on an interim basis and reluctantly mm -hmm. because he was retired. Incidentally, Godfrey Dewey's father was the author of the Dewey Decimal System, which should be, Every of, some, library <laughs> knows, yes. should be of some interest to you. Uh, but nonetheless, he uh, stepped in and I, I thought performed a uh, a wonderful and perhaps a unique function in holding the college together. Not that it was in any way disintegrating, <coughs> excuse me, but it was a moment of instability with the loss of, of, of a president. And he stayed on, I suppose, longer than he expected to. But uh, again, he had a scholarly background. Uh, he was not immersed in speech as such. As a matter of fact, he was not a terribly good speaker himself, but just a wonderful cohesing uh, element uh, that was badly needed at the time. The uh, next gentleman was, his name was Jonathan French. I'm not sure that he was ever actually inaugurated as a president not, here. He uh, was, uh, I think not formally inaugurated. He was dean of the college at the time. He stepped in after right, uh, Godfrey Dewey stepped down then? That's right. Um, this occurred, uh, let's see, about 1959, as I recall, because it was the year that I was on sabbatical. Uh, he was a good friend of mine, and uh, I know he had many difficult moments uh, because he w was not a popular choice, even as an interim president. Um, 
and he used to come down to Washington where I was in stationed. I was on military leave of absence at the time. Uh, he came down to Washington uh, occasionally just to talk with me about some problems he was having. But again, uh, he performed a function and uh, um, I, I still have high respect for Jonathan French. I think he would not have made a good long-term permanent president. And then the, the fourth and final president of your tenure here was uh, Justice McKinley. Yeah. Well, it's difficult really to assess Justice's tenure here. Overall, um, he certainly gave a, a kind of an aura of, oh, the word is, is difficult to come by, but an aura of belonging, family, I, I would say. Um, he had actually been a member of the history faculty he, he had back been in a, the 40s. Yes, right? uh, the, uh, back in the late 1940s. He was chairperson of the history department and uh, aspired to be the president, as I understand it. But, uh, of course, Dr. Green was appointed. Hmm. So uh, Dr. McKinley went to Springfield College and was chairperson of the history department there for the intervening years. And then he came here. He was a a compassionate man, a fatherly figure, and uh, I must say he was highly supportive of me uh, and encouraged me and uh, did his very best to see that broadcasting got its due share. Not, not an extraordinary share of it, but its due share. So, I, in summation, uh, he served a useful purpose for a period of time which, and these were difficult times. I remember the enrollment in one year got down to something like 265, and there were all sorts of dire predictions of the demise of Emerson. But um, at one he, point, they even considered merging with merging, another institution. Yes, right? yes, yes. But overall, as I say, he was a cohesive influence uh, on the college. Uh, uh, on a personal level, he was a, a grand person, and I, he and I got along very well together, very well together. So there was a lot of upheaval, both uh, in terms of leadership and in terms of finances during this time, yes. and yet the, uh, the broadcasting department continued to grow and the equipment got bigger and better and fancier. Uh, you talked a little bit about the money that you raised uh, to help the college afford all of these things. Yes. Um, and it is my impression that there wasn't really a bona fide development department at the college no. at that time. No, there was not. Uh, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about your development functions. Yeah. Well, some of them I took on personally. Uh, I'm not a fundraiser. I'm a good cajoler uh, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes have some influence. I, I don't use a heavy hand. Uh, I, I make a plea for pity and all that sort of thing. But I, I realized that it was beyond my ken. So I got the idea of inviting in people in the, at first, the local broadcast community. Mm -hmm to share with them what we were trying to do in the broadcasting department and then to have them take on some of the the responsibility for it. You have here before me uh, a picture of one such gentleman, uh, Sherwood Tarlow. His wife was a graduate of Emerson, so he had some sort of an affinity for the college, but he was also the owner-manager of uh, a local radio station, I think in one of the suburbs, maybe Medford. Anyway, he became quite interested in our work, and he did head up a campaign, as we note here, to raise, I guess we were shooting for $5,000 then for the purchase of this new transmitter. And uh, those efforts were amazingly successful. Uh, it was kind of unknown to Emerson because uh, 
even uh, I guess we were up to about twenty five hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't think they had raised twenty five hundred dollars in any one year for the whole college. So that was the beginning of it. And then later, uh, particularly when we embarked upon uh, greater sophistication of WERS and the introduction of television, I uh, got the idea of expanding this to a national level. And the key person here was one Henry Shakti. Mm -hmm. uh, Henry was the then executive vice president of Lever Brothers uh, and a very powerful advertising man. Yeah, here I he is. I wonder if he's there. Yes, he is. He's on the very end. <clears throat> Well, here's this how This is in the Broadcasting Advisory uh, This is committee, the Broadcasting right? Advisory Committee, and I can't identify all of these. Uh, I wouldn't ask you to. Yeah, but <laughs> anyway, uh, they were both local and national, mm -hmm. from advertising and from networks. And Henry Shakti was a leading force in this. I, uh, it's interesting how I came to know Henry Shakti. I was here at the college during the Christmas holidays, I, I guess it was oh, maybe about the 15th of December, I happened to be in my office, there was a telephone call. And uh, they said, it's uh, Mr. Henry Shakti from Lever Brothers calling. Well, who the heck from Lever Brothers is calling me? So he got on the phone and he explained that he had a son, Peter, uh, who aspired to a broadcasting career. And uh, he was uh, canvassing the, the possibilities and the name of Emerson College had come up. And somehow my name in particular, I don't know where from, but anyway. He said, um, my wife and I and Peter would like to come up sometime during the Christmas holidays to visit with you. They did. They apparently were impressed. Peter did enroll. And he graduated from Emerson. Um, he went into advertising, as might be expected, because this was what his father was involved in. And uh, Peter was not a good performer. I mean, he would be the first to admit it, but he was a energetic young man, and uh, as far as I know, he's doing well in the advertising business. But anyway, Henry, I put this idea before Henry. We need support. Well, he had all sorts of contacts in New York among advertising agencies because they were beholden to him yeah. for major accounts. So he assembled a wonderful group. Now, this is representative in any one year, but I remember in one year we had uh, Pat Weaver, who was then president and chairman of the board of NBC, and he came here for meetings. We had meetings maybe three times a year, and then we had an annual banquet, and he was the guest speaker at one of those. But And I remember David Ogilvie of Ogilvie, Mather, Mather and Benson, advertising agency, Scotsman and many, many uh, very influential. I see there Bill Swartley was then vice president and general manager of WBZ at the time. So they were instrumental in putting us in touch with sources of, of substantial amounts of money. Now I have a question for you about your interaction with this particular body because yeah. the way I see it, advertisers are the fuel that runs commercial television and to my knowledge that's contrary to what you feel television should and could be. Yeah. I wonder if you had any I conflict see. in dealing with uh, an advisory group that was so heavily uh, weighed towards the advertising industry. Well, uh, it would be naive of me to, to say offhand that there was no conflict of, of philosophy or point of view here, there was. But I, I tried to explain it that what we're trying to do here is to provide a substantial education in the liberal arts as well as in the specialized thing, but frankly admitting the, the finite limits to which we would go in the training of, of the specialty. Mm -hmm. uh, they were understanding of this. As a matter of fact, most of these people, if not all of them, were highly supportive of the liberal arts element of it. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of uh, an old canard that I've heard oh, time and time again about the difference between a chief executive officer and a personnel officer. If you ask a chief executive officer of an institution what sort 
of educational background he would most desire for an employee, he will inevitably say a broad liberal arts background. But if you ask the personnel director down below, he will say, I want some specially trained who's ready to move into the job right away. Well, for the most part, these were statesmen, and they understood the broad picture. Now, we quibbled over uh -huh. content and the amount of it and concentration and this sort of thing, but they were understanding and I, I would say generally supportive when this was explained to them. They became a part of it. It seems like a dream come true that you could put together an advisory board that had the president of CBS and all these powerful figures in the industry. Well, Whatever happened to the Broadcasting Advisory Committee at Emerson College? I don't know. It was still alive and kicking the year I left here. And it was one of my proud achievements uh, simply because I was the genesis of the idea. Now, as for its success and functioning, I give it to Henry Shakti in the first place, and then for the quality of, of the other people who finally uh, became members of this advisory committee. And it was an influential, not only in spreading the word about Emerson, mm -hmm. Emerson College in general, broadcasting in particular, but in a practical way of raising money for us. But uh, I don't know what happened to it, and I think it's lamentable that it's no longer in existence. So 1960 came and you left Emerson College. Yes. What, what were your reasons for going? I can't imagine that the college would have let you go. Well, I, in the preceding year, 1959 to 1960, I took a leave of absence with full pay, mm -hmm. and I bless Emerson for this, it was unheard of. Uh, to pursue a, a doctorate degree at Columbia University and uh, the understanding was that I would return for a minimum of one year, mm -hmm. which I did. And so I, I left in the, f I think, uh, August of 1960. You asked the reason. Well, <clears throat> I've always, I suppose, uh, had aspirations for higher administration in higher education. And uh, my concentration in my doctorate degree was in the administration of higher education, and in particular in community colleges. There was an opportunity for me to become interim president at Newton Junior College, which was a fine, municipally supported community college in the city of Newton. Uh, I served as the interim president for about four or five months, and the president who was on leave decided to stay on leave, so I was elevated to the presidency of Newton Junior College. And it meant a new career for me, but one which was very much in line with some of the aspirations that I have. I wasn't forsaking broadcasting. I'll tell you one thing. I was becoming a little jaded uh, with the directions in broadcasting the over-commercialization, the, the lack of the, the kind of variety that I've talked about here, and what I saw as a, a kind of formulization of, of programming, and that had something to do with it. But in any event, I, I embarked upon a new career, and I served as president of Newton Junior College for 16 years, and I'm very proud of that little institution. It was the first accredited two-year public college in New England, and uh, we had a whole series of rather remarkable innovations. First associate degree nursing program, which qualified graduates to take the regular registered nursing examination. And it was just a, another very memorable and, and very satisfying experience for me. And then collaterally with that, I had the opportunity to become involved nationally. I was for four years a member of the board of directors of the American Association of Community and Junior Colleges. For five years, I was president of the New England Junior College Council. This is not breast beating. I mean, it's just uh, things that I did. And I think uh, among the most satisfying was my involvement in the accreditation process. Uh, for four years, I was a member of the Commission on Institutions of Higher Education, 
of the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, the regional accrediting agency. That was a very valuable experience. So it was 16 years, uh, albeit abruptly brought to an end in 1976, April 6, when I had a, a series of heart attacks uh, from which I barely recovered. Now in 19... But I did. And, and you're still, you run a consulting firm today for uh, Yeah, businesses? a consulting firm, and for 10 years I was executive director part-time of a consortium of uh, eight, nine colleges in southeastern Massachusetts. That kept me busy, kept my hand in, and was a form of therapy. And, and you're still teaching? Yeah, and tonight I'm going to be a guest lecturer at uh, a course in speech at Mass Bay Community College. My assignment is the whole realm of broadcast speech, radio and television. Kind how, of like, how long do you have to cover that topic? I have three hours, mm. <laughs> and uh, normally it would take me for well, four semesters, I suppose. Now, in 1960, you were elected to uh, you were elected a member of the Emerson College Corporation. So, even though you left uh, your teaching responsibilities here, you've stayed in touch with the development of oh, the yes. college. You're still a member of the corporation today yes. and attend the annual meetings. Yes, I am. So, as just kind of a summation here, I'd like to give you uh, an opportunity to comment from an outsider's and insider's and an outsider's mm -hmm. point of view on what's happened at Emerson since mm -hmm. you left, uh, what you think uh, might have been different yeah. if you'd stayed on here. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure anything would have been different if I'd stayed on, uh, but uh, in any event, I have watched it with a great deal of interest and uh, some involvement, not very much, but certainly a, a kind of a visceral involvement that I've always felt for the place. Um, in general, I applaud the rather general course that it's, it's taken. I differ in particulars. There was a time uh, after I left here when there were thoughts of it's becoming more of a liberal arts institution and less identified with the specialty. Uh, happily, that was somehow aborted because I think it would have been a mistake. Uh, I certainly heartily support liberal arts as a crucial element in a broad education, but for Emerson to have gone that route would have made it one of a number of small institutions all struggling for survival, and the only ones that were likely to survive would be the long-standing, very prestigious ones. I felt then and feel now that Emerson's destiny is and will be in its reliance upon its specialization, not forgetting that this has to be embedded in the matrix of a sound liberal arts education, but I think it would have been a mistake to go that route. Now, the question is how far you go in specialization how much of the ground do you cover? Well, uh, I would say in the intervening time it's covered considerable ground and I'm, I'm not sure that all of it is, is appropriate, but um, I don't discourage it. Um, you, you said that one of the reasons why you left is because you wanted to uh, work in a higher administrative office. Yes, yes. Did you ever want or did you think you ever would be appointed president of Emerson College? Uh, that's, a, that's a direct question. I'll give you a direct answer. At first, no. I had no notion of that. Certainly when I left here, I, it wasn't out of any disenchantment or any uh, discouragement about a lost cause or anything of that sort. But uh, as I saw a progression of presidents, after Dr. McKinley, not a progression, but there were, yeah, there, there were several, one of whom I greatly admired, uh, Richard Chapin, a very able person, and then one uh, whom I thought was not appropriate to the mission of Emerson. Uh, and uh, after his resignation, uh, yeah, the thought crossed my mind, but I didn't actively pursue it. I do remember, though, that I was 
in uh, Leechmere, out in Dedham one evening, and I was approached by the late Hegda Matarosian, mm -hmm. who was a good friend of mine. And we struck up a conversation. He says, Charles, he says, have you ever thought of becoming president of Emerson? I said, not seriously. He says, well, he says, I want you to know that there's a group of the alumni that would like to put your name up for nomination. I said, well, that's all right with me. I said, I'm not actively going to pursue it. I will present my credentials, but beyond that, no. Well, it got into the hopper. I think it started out with something over 100 applications. It finally was winnowed down to 15. I survived that, down to 10. I survived that, and it got down, I understand, to about five. But it went to the, the guy whom I didn't particularly think was appropriate. And that was the end of it. Um, I don't know. Um, as it happened, uh, a year later, I had a heart attack. And I, I was, uh, destiny took care of my future career. And I, I resigned as president of, of uh, Newton Junior College at that time. And I never was able to go back to full-time academic employment. So destiny has a way of answering these things. But um, it would have been interesting. I have one final question yeah. for you. WERS celebrated its 40th anniversary this past year. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about your, your child, as it were, as it uh, reaches middle age? Do you listen to WERS? Uh, only to see if things have changed. Uh, I am disappointed. I am heartily disappointed. Uh, it has departed so far from its original intent that uh, I, I can say nothing but less than generous things about it. It has become a single format, almost single format station. Or yes, it attempts some variety. But every time I tune it on, I get this throbbing drum drum beat. I, again, I'm not intolerant of that kind of music. My son loves it. Uh, but to make this almost the single focus of it and to build a, a rather specialized, exclusive audience around that is a mistake. And the other thing is that it apparently, though it does have a, a very responsible station manager, it is largely the province of students. And that's fine. I elaborated on that before. I, I thought that was a function, but not the dominant function. I would like it to return to something of the original intent of it as a, a quality, educational, cultural station, but not forgetting what constitutes elements of our culture, all of it. I would like to see it exploit the enormous cultural resources in this area. I've already told you about some of the things that we did. They're still here. And in Emerson itself, there are enormous resources I'd like to see that brought into it once again. And then I would like to see the control of it reposed where it logically and legally belongs, and that is in the Board of Trustees of Emerson College. They are the licensee of the station, not students. God bless the students. I enjoyed my career uh, in being involved with students. I have high respect for their abilities and their commitment. But in this particular case, um, I have different views on it. I would hope in the eventual future when you move to a new campus that this will be the fortunate and strategic time to take a new look. You'd have to do it before, but it would be, I think, the, the strategic time to think in terms of a, a much broader, more elevated contribution that the station can and did at one time make. Thank you very much, Dr. Dudley, for being so generous with your time and your memories today. I, well, it's just one more in a long line of contributions you've made to Emerson well, College. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Um, it's brought back a lot of memories, and uh, I think you know uh, a couple of chokes along the way, but. Uh, it was an enormously gratifying experience and one uh, which I will always cherish and thank you very much.
88.9 WERS.